When we started the thing, I, I didn't even know who the Taliban were. I, you know, I didn't know how radical they were or just what they were about. One of the things with the Taliban is, is they, they didn't have a clue about the oil and gas business. The idea was, was to bring them over and establish some credibility with the, with the uh, Taliban that, that we were a real company. Marty Miller secretly invited a group of Taliban leaders to UNICAL's headquarters in Sugarland, Texas. No press covered the event. I have some uh, statues that uh, I got in Indonesia, and they're figures of, of people carved out of ironwood, and the people are naked. And I had uh, one of these uh, uh, professors, Islamic professors, uh, check my house out, and when he saw these things, he said, hmm, I don't think that's gonna work with the Taliban. He said, what we'll do, he said, you got some black uh, trash bags? I said, yeah. He said, we'll put burkas on them. <laughs> so that's what we did. We put burkas on the statues. Marty Miller was vice president of oil company Unocal. They wanted to build a huge oil and gas pipeline through Taliban-controlled areas of Afghanistan. But how did these negotiations influence U.S. foreign policy towards the Taliban? The Afghan capital of Kabul is preparing for a new era. Foreign forces have mostly withdrawn, and Afghan soldiers and police will now be responsible for security in the country. But in 2014, 5,000 of them were killed in battles against the Taliban. But the Taliban hasn't always been an enemy of the West. Today, their former foreign secretary lives in a heavily guarded house in one of Kabul's better suburbs. During the 90s, he was involved in discussions with the American oil company Unocal. The power of the Taliban is the Unocal's country, the Taliban is the Taliban. The Taliban is the Taliban, and the Taliban is the Taliban, and the Taliban is the Taliban. Since the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979, the country has been in a state of constant warfare. During the Afghan insurgency, the Mujahideen received extensive weapons support from the United States and Britain in their struggle against the Russians. The Soviet occupation ended in 1989. Two years later, the Soviet Union also collapsed. UNOCAL's CEO, John Imel, saw an opportunity in the fall of the Iron Curtain. At the time the uh, Soviet Union broke up and China opened up, which happened more or less at the same time, we had a very senior guy uh, 
kind of cruising the former Soviet Union to look for opportunities. Uh, we realized that uh, Turkmenistan had huge world-class gas reserves, which were produced by the Soviet Union, but after breakup, they were not produced any longer because Russia had its own gas supplies to bring to market from Siberia. So uh, Turkmenistan was stuck with reserves and no market. Unocal wanted to build two pipelines, one for oil and one for gas. The pipelines would go from Turkmenistan through Afghanistan, Pakistan and India, a distance of well over 1,700 kilometers. Construction costs would be close to $10 billion. Afghanistan could earn $400 million per year in transportation costs, which would more than double the Afghan government's income at that time. It's a wonderful idea. There's all the reasons in the world why it should happen. First of all, the economic benefits that would, that would spawn to each individual country. And of course, the whole area is just in, in turmoil. You know, the Pakistanis don't like the Afghans, the Afghans don't like the Pakistanis, the Turkmen are skeptical of both of them, and then you got India and Pakistan, all of that. You know, it's just a mess in there. And one of the things we were thinking about was that, you know, if we could get this big project that involves, say, even up to Kazakhstan, where Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, that all of these have, have a vested, uh, a common interest in something, that might help bring them together to calm things down and, and where they start working together instead of being at odds with each other all the time. There was a power vacuum after the withdrawal of Soviet forces and local warlords fought over territory in a protracted civil war. In the north, people gathered around the Northern Alliance and its leader, Ahmed Shah Massoud, the so-called Lion of Panjshir. In the south and east, another movement began to assert itself in ethnic Pashtun areas. They called themselves the Taliban and were supported militarily by Pakistan, then in conflict with India. The Pakistanis were trying to impose their will on the future of Afghanistan, and they wanted to ensure that Afghanistan was not going to be a strong, viable nation state that could in any way reconnect, as they had in the past, with India. Taliban leader Mullah Mohammed Omar was a war hero from the years of insurgency against the Soviet Union. Pakistan decided it was going to assist Mullah Mohammed Omar and this group, which had no name. And what they provided was money and weaponry, tra training, ammunition, trucks, tactical advice. And then eventually they provided the Talibs, the students, religious students, Afghans and Pakistanis in the, what became to be 13,000 uh, madrasas within the northwestern frontier province to uh, join and go in in the fight. Before becoming an attorney, Julie Sears worked as an intelligence analyst at the Pentagon. Her sources in Afghanistan warned against UNICAL's close relationship with the Taliban. Worldwide, there was a very broad perception that UNICAL was working with the US government to promote the Taliban as the most likely source for a, a stable, single group controlling Afghanistan. And there was, I think, an effort or a hopefulness on the part of some that if this pipeline could be put through, it could be a source of stability or development for Afghanistan. I personally didn't like the idea that that stability would mean that the Taliban would be in charge. With the civil war raging, 
Marty Miller went on his first journey into Afghanistan. At the time, there were uh, six or seven warlords that were feuding with each other, and it was, uh, you know, Af Afghanistan was not a real safe place to be. The first thing I noticed was the devastation. It kind of reminded me of, of pictures I'd seen of uh, uh, Germany post-World War II. The uh, Taliban headquarters, it was, it was a house that uh, was still all intact, but there wasn't a stick of furniture in the house at all. We, we slept on the floor. And I, and I had a, it was kind of a little traveling road show sort of thing. Of course, you don't have slide projectors or anything because there wasn't even electricity in the building. But I had some diagrams and charts and showing them uh, some things and, and some, uh, just basically to describe the project and, and, and to tell them what the benefits would be. And they, they were very interested. The, the message was always, if you guys will quit fighting with each other and form a government that gets UN recognition that allows us to attract World Bank and ADB financing, then we may have a deal. But the Taliban were on the offensive and drove the Northern Alliance out of the cities of Mazar-e-Sharif and Kabul. They then controlled most of the country. Mohammed Najbullah, president during the Soviet occupation, had been spared by the Northern Alliance. But the Taliban showed no mercy. Najbullah was first tortured, castrated, and then hanged alongside his brother. The execution was a clear sign of what kind of regime had seized power in Kabul. Julie Sirs traveled in secrecy to Kabul in 1997 in order to learn more about the new regime. So I had gone into Kabul when it was held by the Taliban, secretly, uh, basically dressed as, as an Afghan woman in a burqa. They seemed very foreign to me. Certainly many Afghans are conservative Muslims, but even among them, they generally do not support the sort of extremism that the Taliban stand for. I, I see the Taliban really as an alien force. Their attitude toward women or, or a number of human rights issues I found disturbing, but I think it was that larger sort of geopolitical issue of them being backed by the Pakistanis that was most disturbing to me. The Taliban came in power. They declared their own government, but they didn't have good experience with government. The Taliban means the religious students working, studying, learning in seminaries in the madrasas. The curriculum there, it was not capable to, to, to enable them to work with the international community. That was the problem, I think. America's concern about Afghanistan had been minimal before the UNOCAL pipeline project, but oil and gas negotiations sparked the Clinton administration's interest in the country. I'd probably go to Washington, D.C. Oh, once every six to eight weeks, and uh, I would typically meet with the uh, State Department, the NSA, the CIA, CIA was, was very, very helpful. You know, they have this shadowy uh, image, I guess you call it, but uh, I found them very straightforward and very professional. And I think the Clinton administration was uh, really committed to uh, helping, uh, you know, American business uh, be successful. And uh, we enjoyed uh, really strong support from the U.S. government. 
Unical wasn't the only oil company that wanted to build a pipeline in Afghanistan. Argentine company Bridas was also trying to do a deal with the Taliban. Bridas was the first time Bridas was the first time that the Taliban 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 was The Taliban delegation arrived at UNICAL's headquarters in December 1997. Marty came home one day and said, what would you think about having uh, a group of Taliban a delegation come to our home for dinner? Didn't know what to say at the time. I had to think it through. And um, I was pretty naive. Maybe if they come and, and see Americans home and realize that we're uh, average, regular people. Maybe it, it would, you know, be good for them to, to do this. So I agreed to do it. Caroline and Marty Miller did their utmost to avoid offending their Taliban visitors and removed all their religious pictures and figures. But they did not remove the Christmas trees. The year that the Taliban came to our house, uh, there was a, a charity fundraiser thing, and we had seven Christmas trees in our house. And the Taliban just, that blew their mind. They couldn't figure out what that was all about. And I think they were trying to make a connection between a Christmas tree and, and, and the birth of Jesus Christ. And, and uh, you know, they're trying to make a religious uh, connection with what's this Christmas tree all about. <laughs> they never did understand, I don't think. In the days that followed, the Taliban leaders got a guided tour of Marty's hometown. It all started with a visit to Houston Zoo. Then they explored the NASA Space Center. The tour ended in a giant mall where they shopped for stockings, combs and cold weather jackets. They stayed at a, uh, a motel that was across the Southwest Freeway from our office. And uh, uh, we found out later that, uh, like when the maids cleaned their room, that they never had to make the bed or change the sheets. <laughs> they just slept on the floor. And uh, I guess that's, you know, what they're accustomed to. As a whole, the Western culture is totally different from uh, Eastern culture, but deformed. Uh, the United States, our, our progress society and a progress government, they were impressed on that. Dressed in their newly acquired jackets, the Afghans visited one of UNICAL's offshore platforms. The impression I got is they were amazed, they were stunned to see these platforms in the Gulf of Mexico. They were sitting in like 300 feet of water. I think just the magnitude and the complexity of things, uh, they were pretty well blown away by it. The next leg of their journey took the visitors to Omaha, Nebraska, where they met one of America's foremost experts on Afghanistan petroleum resources. The United States were trying their best to talk to the Taliban, who were obviously beginning to take over the whole of Afghanistan. The State Department asked me to talk to the Taliban, and they brought them in here. And so this room, instead of having guys in suits and ties like they always had before, these were Taliban in, uh, you know, uh, skull caps and turbans and, and long beards. And I was like, okay, they're Afghans, no problem. And so I told them, I showed them all this neat whiz bang. So, uh, satellite imagery and stuff, and they uh, you're looking at our country. Yeah, we're looking at your country, we, and you can do this too. We'll show you how to do this. All you need to do is come over here and uh, get educated in this stuff. The Taliban team's journey ended in Washington, D.C., where they met leading officials at the State Department. 
the State Department was still hopeful that this was going to be a part of an international combined effort that would be profitable for UNICAL, profitable for the Afghans commercially and financially, profitable for the Afghans in terms of development and education, uh, profitable for the region. The Taliban were interested in the project. They were keen on uh, making it happen. They never did uh, sign a cooperation agreement or anything like that because they were afraid to sign anything without knowing specifically that Mullah Omar was, uh, was behind it. There are hardly any pictures of the mysterious Taliban leader. In this rare footage of him, Mullah Omar tries to hide behind a blanket. When I was in Kandahar the first time, he was there, and they kept saying that they were going to go talk. In fact, I asked if I could go see him, and they said, no, 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 that's, you're not senior enough to see the Mullah Omar. While Unical was in dialogue with the Taliban about the pipelines, another actor began to assert himself in Afghanistan, Osama bin Laden. This son of a Saudi construction millionaire was a local hero because he participated in the insurgency against the Soviet Union. He returned to Afghanistan in 1996 after having been forced to leave the Sudan. Now, he was preparing for a new war, global jihad. When Taliban captured Nigrahar, then consequently captured Kabul in 1996, they found Osama bin Laden and his colleagues in Nigrahar. So, the Taliban moved him to Kandahar to be protected there. His arrival back in Afghanistan coincided with, with my own to work with the UN. Never met the Osama bin Laden. I saw him once in the bazaar in his convoy car passing by, but I never, you know, we didn't waver anything. We didn't know each other. We're looking at the other, so. That first year uh, that he was in the area was the time when he solidified his relationship with Mullah Muhammad Omar. In Afghanistan, Marty Miller and Unocal had initiated the training of local workers who were to be employed on the so-called peace pipeline. We'd like to hire locally, so we had employment opportunities for the Afghans. And in fact, one of the things we did in Kandahar is we established a, a training center. We uh, found an old abandoned warehouse that we outfitted and we brought some equipment in, you know, welding equipment, uh, tools that were needed for the training. Without being aware of it, Marty Miller had established his training center in the same street as Osama bin Laden's house. And I'd never heard of the guy before. I didn't know who he was. Looking back on it, I'm uh, kind of gives me the creeps <laughs> to think about how I was that close to that guy. Osama bin Laden was also busy building training facilities. Bin Laden eventually became responsible for organizing the flow of foreign fighters between Chechnya, Bosnia, and the Arab world. For the Taliban, these soldiers were useful reinforcements in the fight against the Northern Alliance. This enabled bin Laden to strengthen his alliance with the Taliban and to recruit soldiers for his holy war on the Western world. Uh, 
للعمليات الاستشهادية حدثوها كثيرا في البداية نفسك ما تعلم الأمر تظن أن الأمر صعب جدا ولكن ما يلبث أنت ما جئت هنا إلا وفي قلبك حب الله وحب الرسول عليه الصلاة والسلام يا بلاد الوحي صبرا يا بلاد On the 7th of August 1998, a bomb exploded at the U.S. Embassy in Nairobi. Simultaneously, a bomb detonated in neighboring Tanzania. 224 people died in these terrorist attacks, and more than 4,000 were injured. The Al-Qaeda trademark was established, serial attacks triggered by suicide bombers. I don't think I was terribly surprised when I heard about what had happened because bin Laden was there and he was able to do it from Afghanistan and he was being protected by the Taliban. The young spy wanted to learn more about bin Laden and visited his enemies, the Northern Alliance. It was a perilous journey on horseback along bad roads. My interest was what was going on in the anti-Taliban areas because that was an area where we did not have a lot of information. And my sense from back in Washington is that a lot of officials and policymakers were just writing off the resistance to the Taliban. She met Northern Alliance leader Ahmad Shah Massoud, who asked for support from the West in the fight against the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. They certainly seemed a much more viable option inside Afghanistan than they had appeared from the outside. Their morale was generally good. Uh, increasing numbers of Afghans coming to them from Taliban areas wanting their assistance in fighting the Taliban. So to me, they seemed like a very viable alternative to the Taliban if only they were able to have more support. During her visit, Sirs got a unique insight into what was to come. Northern Alliance prisons were full of jihadists from several countries. Their goal was to participate in the global jihad. She was especially shocked by what the prisoners told her about the close relationship between Pakistan, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. Massoud urgently wanted to alert the West. He wanted more people to know about the Taliban and how they were interacting with bin Laden and um, to emphasize that if we were opposing bin Laden, that we should really realize that he and the Taliban were sharing the same aims and goals and resources and funding. But Julie Sir's report was not well received by her bosses at the Pentagon. The State Department was even more annoyed People were saying they were very upset about my trip, and I was told I simply wasn't going to be able to, to stay and that they weren't going to give me my security clearance back. So essentially, they fired me. Even at that time, I think the State Department would have been happier having the Taliban control the whole country and having Massoud go away. We didn't want to see the Taliban as our enemy at that time. I think there was still an idea that the Taliban were very separate from bin Laden, that we could ultimately negotiate with the Taliban to kick out bin Laden, and then our problem would be solved. The Clinton administration continued in its efforts to influence the Taliban regime. We were in the middle of, you know, trying to get them to modify their behavior. And I'm a believer in you talk to your friends and your enemies. Talking is not acceptance of those practices. From day one, the Clinton administration was trying to push back and first, you know, cajole and then pressure the Taliban regime into changing. And of course, that escalated once Osama bin Laden left Sudan and went to Afghanistan in 1996. Uh, the bombings of 98 were conducted from there, so it was very much on the forefront. The problem of Osama bin Laden stood in the way of any agreement about future oil and gas pipelines. He had declared war on America, and 
the simultaneous bombings of our embassies in Tanzania and Kenya really put us on a war footing with Osama bin Laden. And from that point on, we were actually trying to, to kill him. On the 20th of August, 1997, President Clinton ordered the launch of cruise missiles against several Al-Qaeda bases in Afghanistan. Four of the bases were destroyed. In all, 25 Al-Qaeda operators were killed, but Osama bin Laden himself escaped. I remember when uh, President Clinton sent some cruise missiles into Afghanistan. Uh, I, I just, that's when I told uh, my boss and the board of directors that it was time that this, this wasn't going to go anywhere anytime soon. At that point, UNICAL withdrew from the pipeline project, but the French intelligence analyst Jean-Charles Brissard argues that the idea of an oil and gas pipeline lived on. The United States was thinking they were pressuring the Taliban to release bin Laden um, by negotiating about the pipeline. At the same time, the Taliban were thinking they were cooling the United States about bin Laden by discussing with them about the pipeline. For Mullah Omar, the pipeline issue was a leverage in preserving his country from U.S. strikes and avoiding to take a decision on, on bin Laden. Osama bin Laden was also interested in continued pipeline negotiations. A strategy memo from bin Laden's close aide, Mohammed Atef, was found during the investigation of the 1998 East Africa embassy attacks. This memo, uh, written by Mohammed Atef, it states clearly that as far as the Taliban were maintaining relationship uh, in some way with, with American businesses over this project or uh, US diplomats, hmm, their security, Al-Qaeda security, was guaranteed. The terror attacks against the East African embassies tested the relationship between the Taliban and the Al-Qaeda leader. His presence in Afghanistan uh, became a big hurdle between the, the, the relationship between Afghanistan and the international community. Sources say Mullah Omar had a furious showdown with Osama bin Laden after the East Africa bombings. The terrorist attacks obstructed Omar's plans for a caliphate in Afghanistan. Allah. Rahullah Keplavak was one of the Taliban commanders in Mullah Omar's close circle. Allahu <laughs> Afghanistan <laughs> We know that there was a debate inside the, the Taliban between the hardliners and, and, and others. There were people that were clearly identifying um, Osama bin Laden as a threat. Towards the end of the 90s, the pipelines were no longer on the agenda in talks between the US and the Taliban. The US asked 30 times for Osama bin Laden to be handed over, but the Taliban gave no clear answer. The talks went essentially nowhere. The Taliban, the more we would push them, the more they'd push back, the more we'd push them on Al-Qaeda, uh, expelling Osama bin Laden, the more they would push back. They just got more defiant.
چونکی دا پانانو دا طبیعت دی چی توک میمان نواد خلق دی بود طالبانو دا عار پا دان بنی نوری او دا عار ازان ایندا زان تنب پریشو بی چی دا خلق دا عار پا دی بنی ووائی نو دا طالبانو پا دا غنیسوات نکی قبل When George W. Bush came to power in 2001, he renewed attempts to get bin Laden extradited and get started with the construction of the oil pipeline. By then, Unical was out of the picture, but others tried to revive the plans. George W. Bush, he had this direct connection with the oil industry. The idea was to try to be more persuasive with the Taliban. Al-Qaeda made a special documentary about the prelude to September the 11th. American-born Adam Gadan is the film's narrator. An attack on Afghanistan had been planned for a long time. The Americans were boiling mad about a number of things. The Islamic Emirates' domination of strategic energy reserves, as well as the route of a, a proposed gas pipeline from the Caspian Sea. And most of all, its refusal to hand over Sheikh Osama. In July 2001, a final dramatic meeting about the Taliban was arranged between representatives of the United States government and other players in the region. At a point during the, these talks, there's a US representative that would make this ultimatum that you'll have either the carpet of gold or the carpet of bomb. The Americans had informed their allies during a meeting in Germany of their plan to invade Afghanistan in the autumn before the first snowfall, which is what they eventually did. So we knew it was coming. The question was, do we sit back and wait, or do we surprise them with a preemptive strike? It was a very bad incident. I found it very tragic and terrible for the people of the United States. Innocent people were, were being killed. Uh, I was in the Afghanistan, and I was in Afghanistan, and the Taliban were in the Afghanistan, and the Taliban were in the Afghanistan, and the Taliban were in the Afghanistan. داسې نه چې یوازې د ټولو طالبانو سره د فکر و چې کشکې دا کار سوی نه وای د طالبان آفر ته اکسترادایت اسامه بن لادن ته ا ثرد کنتری بټ ناو د امریکنز هد دیسایدد ته ریموف بوت هیم اند د طالبان اون د 7 اف اکتوبر امریکا اند بریټن اتاکت The Northern Alliance exploited the resulting chaos and the Taliban regime unraveled. On the 20th of November 2001, the capital city of Kabul fell. With US backing, Hamid Karzai was inaugurated as president. His brother had been working for Unical and Karzai was well acquainted with the pipeline plans. 
soon after 9-11, a couple of months, suddenly we hear that governments from the region got together and basically decided to revive the project. That means that even without knowing the fate of, of Afghanistan in terms of stability, all these countries had come to the same conclusion they had reached before 9-11, that this pipeline was crucial for them, for the interests. After 13 years of war, there is still no pipeline. The Taliban is back in strength and reluctant to negotiate about peace. They collapsed the Taliban government and brought a new government under the title of democracy and the human rights. But they did not bring peace to Afghanistan. The insurgency against the government installed by the international community is still going on. The war against the Taliban has made the building of the pipeline impossible. The Afghan North also has some oil. After the pipeline was shelved, John Imel, who had left UNOCAL, considered investing in an oil and gas project in Mazar-e-Sharif. Look at Afghanistan, the political risk is amazingly high. The geologic risk in the Mazar area is moderate, but the reward part is also moderate. So when you put all that together, it, that's why it's not an interesting investment opportunity for a large company. There are geologists who argue that the country's petroleum resources are larger than previously known. Afghanistan has the best geology in that part of the world for both mineral resources and hydrocarbons, that's pretty spectacular. Why are they so poor? They've not been able to develop those resources. First, they didn't know about them. And then the past 30 years of war, nobody's been able to do much. One Afghan who tried to develop the country's oil resources at an early stage was King Mohammed Zahir Shah. After 30 years in exile, he returned. A lot of Afghanistan's oil history has been forgotten. Mohammed Zahir Shah became king when he was only 19 years old. In 1937, he gave the US firm Inland Exploration Company exclusive rights to oil extraction in the northern areas of the country. They were also given the rights to build a 1600 kilometer pipeline. But the Second World War put a stop to these plans. Older Afghans recalled the king's reign as a time of peace, economic progress, the introduction of democracy and education for women. During that time, tens of thousands of Afghans were being employed by Afghan uh, ministries as mechanics, uh, plumbers, uh, uh, carpenters, drivers, uh, construction workers, welders, etc., nannies, and life was blooming. This convinces me, now I was there through most of this time, that Afghans, when able to set aside their differences, they're able to be very effective, they're hardworking people. King Shah made new attempts to restart Afghan oil and gas production in the 50s and 60s. A series of test wells were drilled and American and Soviet geologists mapped the country's resources. When the Soviet Union invaded the country in 1979, access to Afghanistan's oil and gas resources was one of the objectives of the occupation. John Schroeder was in Afghanistan at the end of the 70s as part of the Atlas Afghanistan project. 
he got a unique insight into the maps of mineral resources. There was one American geologist, me, and 250 Soviet Russian geologists. So when I left Afghanistan in late 78, I was actually deported uh, by the communists who had taken over the government. Uh, I left having sent my maps out of the country in the diplomatic pouch, came back to the United States, and I've worked on the mineral resources in Afghanistan ever since. The Afghan resources to me look like a bonanza for the Afghans. So I just thought Afghanistan can pull itself up by its own resource bootstraps. And that's what I've been saying now for practically 40 years. West of Mazar al-Sharif are the remains of a gas refinery from the Soviet era. The plant is still in operation, but no longer produces as much as when the Russians were there. موردی برابرداری و فعالیت قرار داشته که روزانه در حدود 6 میلیون متر مکعب گاز طبیعی از این تاسیسات استخراج، تصفیه و به جانب شوروی سابق صادر می شده. قبلا مدت زیادی توسط خود قوای شوروی در اینجا پوست های امنیتی بود و قوای از این در اینجا از این تاسیسات Close by is a small fort guarding the gas plant against attacks from the Taliban. In 2007, an experienced oil geologist rediscovered this area. He'd previously worked for UNICAL, but he now worked as head of the Norwegian aid project, Oil for Development. He wanted to help Afghanistan with a new oil law. Mange områder i verden er olje- og gassressurser, direkte og indirekte årsak til konflikt. Jeg velger å se på det som en, en effektiv problemløser, både når det gjelder fattigdom og, og uh, sikkerhet og, og, og levestandard. Geir Itterland was dissuaded from traveling to the north, but with an armed escort, he went anyway. At one gas plant, he discovered a bricked-up room where documentation of Soviet oil and gas production had been hidden. På 90-talet kjørte Taliban rundt og administrerte på sin besynderlige måte landet. Da stort sett gikk ut på å ødelegge skrevne rapporter og dokumentasjon. De har tydeligvis motvilje mot, mot skrevne dokumenter. Og da hadde de åndsnærværelse nok til å mure igjen det rommet hvor dataene lå. Behind the secret wall lay old maps and seismic surveys that showed Afghanistan's oil and gas resources were significantly greater than the outside world was aware of. En veldig tilfredsstillende opplevelse å gå inn i det rommet og etablere at disse dataene virkelig eksisterte. Og de menneskene der var veldig opptatt av å beskytte det og få til aktivitet igjen i det området. De, de, de visste veldig godt hva de gjorde. The administration offices for oil and gas in Mazar al-Sharif are located in old Soviet buildings. Chief engineer Mohammed Jan Akhtari has made it his life's work to preserve the dusty archives. Several times he saved maps and documents from destruction.
مستوری تقریبا 35 سال است که ما در جنگ های تعمیلی داخلی مصروف هستیم و از ابتدای امور تفاوت و افشاف که متخصین کشورهای مختلفی از امریکا گرفته تا سویس تا رومانیا و بلغاریا و تا مواجه است کارهای ما بسیار به کندی پیش رفته در طول تقریبا 35 سال است که ما در جنگ های تعمیلی داخلی مصروف هستیم و از ابتدای امور تفاوت و افشاف که متخصین کشورهای مختلفی از امریکا گرفته تا سویس تا رومانیا گروپای بود که نقشه را تکه تکه کردن بیاید همین سل کنیم و در وزیر نقشه های معیب و معلول مداروم گروپای بود که همین نقشه را تکه تکه کردن باز ما پاسه را جمع کردم رابرتایی بخریدم با کمک رفقه ها از هر جای جمع کردیم همه را ترمیم کردم تشریح کردم این همیزه یک هزار و دو سو شست قطع نقشه را ما تشریح کردم ایچ کس خبر هم نداره که در اینجا چیه است؟ این همه سرمایه معنوی ایرمی مردم ما است این یک روزی به درست میخوره یک روزی به کار میخوره کار کردی تماما متخصینی که از ممالی که مختلف در اینجا آمدن و کار کردن نتایج کاری از دونه است همین ها رو ما همیشه عبز کردم اما دولت ایچ ترس ما سایل هم نداره و ما هم از دولت توقعی نداریم اونا به اون سیاست خود سرگردان هست اونو رابرا هم به خاطر Despite little money and poor health, Akhtari has systemized the files and preserved the valuable data for the future. پنجصد قلم هم زیادتر مصرف کردیم و همیه آثارش موجود است کاغذ خودیم پیدا کردیم اگر نکنم به دولتی نیست که همه پرسان کرد تو چرا کار کردی ما به خاطر آینده خود میکنم به خاطر که از ما آمده ها پس در سال بعد و بیس سال بعد شرایط تغییر میخوره همین نویش های من که میبینه اما برای نواسا و کواسا و افوشت من افتخار است که امنا برای بگ سر بلندی یاد میکنن که خوشا به حال باهوای ما که در اون شرایط عمدی شروع چپور سرگردان بود این اینی کتابا رو نوشته کرد این کتابای This is hand writing Wow, how beautiful writing it is شاش ما سر اینی نقشه کار کنیم یک کتاب نشته کنیم حالا فیلا دیر کار است این این بکشم این کتابا رو هفته 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 شش هفته رو جور کنیم for over 40 years, Afghans have prayed for peace and dreamed of a better life. A better life is also about memories of what once was. About the time hope flourished and the country's hidden mineral wealth was estimated at $1,000 billion. First the Soviets wanted the resources and then they got driven out by the Afghans. The United States didn't pay any attention to the resources itself, uh, our military only wised up to the fact that it was rich in resources only a couple years ago. But now more and more Afghans know the resources are there and they can come out of the ground if you stop the fighting. The United States once hoped the peace pipeline would unite the warring parties in Afghanistan. They still do. Amazingly enough, they still want to build it. America's arch enemy, Iran, also wants to build an oil and gas pipeline to India. Tehran is in a hurry. The aim is that a new peace pipeline should be completed in 2017. But again, it has to go through Taliban-controlled areas. Peace with the Taliban is more important than ever. Well, it's at risk of deja vu all over again. It's not impossible that the Taliban would come back to power. They are an element. They're not going away. And in order to have uh, 
I would say peace, not necessarily yet prosperity in Afghanistan. They're going to have to be part of that fabric of society. The more you can bring them into the tent and encourage moderate elements to emerge, the more stable Afghanistan will be. My short explanation for what happened is, unbeknownst to us, uh, Osama bin Laden bought the Taliban movement. And he did that before we could explain to the Taliban and others the benefits of foreign investment, which is a very complex benefit to try to describe to non-business people when the competition is pouring money in for AK-47s and rocket launchers, which they did understand. That's all he understood. You know, we were horrified at, at, at a lot of the things that the, the Taliban were doing. And, you know, I'd say some of the, of the criticism that was directed at us uh, was fair. <laughs> Looking back, I have to say I was terribly naive. Uh, Henry Kissinger said, this project is a triumph of hope over experience. And that hit me right between the eyes. And I said, oh boy, there's a lot of content in that, in that pithy little comment. And I, it found, it proved to be true. <laughs>